In the first three canti of the Inferno, we are seized immediately and carried away by some of the most gripping and dramatic imagery of the whole comedy. Later, Dante will get philosophical. He will talk about the divisions of hell, or he will argue fine points of doctrine or try to settle contemporary theological debates. But in the beginning of the comedy, Dante just shows us what a good storyteller he can be. Canto I serves as a prologue to the whole of the comedy, by which I mean in this one canto, the poet predicts and outlines in brief the journey the pilgrim will have to take. For example, at the end of Canto I, the poet uses Virgil's speech to the pilgrim to tell us what will happen. I will be your guide, leading you from here through an eternal place, where you shall hear despairing cries. Then you will see the ones who were content to burn because they hope to come among the blessed. Should you desire to ascend to the blessed, you'll find a soul more fit to lead then than I. Verses 113 and following. As you can see in his typically paraphrastic way, Dante, poet, refers to the three locations where his journey will lead. The eternal place of weeping and pain, hell. The place where people suffer but are nevertheless glad because through that pain they are being made clean, purgatory. And the realm of the blessed, heaven. After Canto I, the so-called prologue scene, 33 more Canti will come in the Inferno. And then we'll get 33 more for Purgatorio, and the same number for Paradiso, for a perfect grouping of one plus three groups of 33, 100 Canti. Speaking of patterns of numbers, we should also say something about the Italian rhyme scheme. Most translators don't try to reproduce the rhyme scheme, although Dorothy Sayers in her mid-20th century translation did. What you will see if you look over at the Italian page are groups of three line stanzas, each stanza known as a terzina. You also notice that the first line rhymes with the third line, vita, smarita, as well as that the second line, line introduces a new rhyme, which is repeated twice in the next terzina, thus oscura, verse 2, dura, verse 4, and paura, in verse 6. But then in line 5, we have a new rhyme, namely forte, which will again be repeated at the end of verse 7, morte, and verse 9. Scorte. In terms of rhyme schemes, what we have is A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, in which the unrhymed word in the middle line of each tetsina becomes the rhyme for the following tetsina. We have then a kind of chain of rhymes in which each tetsina is bound by a link to the previous and following stanzas. Thus, from the very beginning of the poem, we have stepped into a world of extraordinary mathematical beauty. All of the drama, all of the action to come, all of the histories and individual personalities will unfold in the midst of this linguistic world, regulated by patterns of threes and tens. That is, the action unfolds in three canticles, each of which has 33 canti, each of, each, while each canto is composed of three line stanzas. For Dante, this order was such a clear and evocative sign of the Trinity. But the action does not just unfold within this sacred space, but is also represented as taking place in sacred time. Through his paraphrastic allusions, Dante establishes with exactitude when this journey takes place. His descent into hell begins precisely on Good Friday, 1300, and, conti and continues until he arrives on the shores of Mount Purgatory at dawn on Easter Sunday. He will spend three nights here until he rises up to see the souls of heaven. Thus, at the very moment that Christ's death and descent in hell and then resurrection was celebrated by the church as a pattern for the Christian life, so does the pilgrim, seemingly not entirely aware of this sacred time, undertake his own journey of a descent and then a dramatic rising to renewed life. In the previous lecture, I spoke of Dante's poetic art, which zooms out and zooms in, which uses both the telescope and the microscope. It looks at the world and its order from great heights, its sacred time and sacred space, but then it zooms in and makes us feel the mysterious interior of the human heart. And this zooming in is exactly what happens in the first canto. As we watch the pilgrim at the beginning of this canto, we feel for him. He invokes, in a sense, our waylessness and lostness. 
But at the same time, as readers, that is, those who are able to enjoy the view from above, having zoomed out, we're able to see the pilgrim's very words and movements are framed in those groups of threes which the author of the book built into his poetry. Thus, from the beginning of the work, we feel a dramatic irony. Although God is very close and present in the poetic fabric of the poem, just as he is, as it were, very close in the order of his universe, those characters speaking within that poetry are often blind to that in which they move and breathe and have their being. Later, when we meet characters who curse God or speak ill of their neighbors, we note the intense irony that they are only able to do so through the breath and heartbeats which God provides. Even our power to curse God or to disown Him or not recognize Him is a gift because of the God who sustains our life. Throughout this course, we'll see that you can read this poem on multiple levels, each of which is true and each level of which exists simultaneously. And so we can, as we are just doing, consider the first th scene from the author's perspective. Or we can try to get inside the poem and see with the pilgrim's eyes. Reading Dante, then, can be a kind of cinematic experience, by which I mean the poet employs a great variety of different types of camera angles. Some portray the character at a distance, some portray him close up, and some pretend to depict what the character sees as if he were looking from his own eyes, the camera angle film critics call the point of view shot. If you've ever seen a movie which, say, depicts a character running, this would be the angle provided by the camera if the actor were running while carrying the camera in his hand. It provides that messy and limited view of the character himself. This is the camera angle the poet forces us to adopt, in a sense, in the first canto to which we turn now. The whole of Canto I is an extraordinary poetic achievement in its ability to create a dreamlike feeling. It's almost nightmarish, isn't it? We feel the kind of irrational pain and fear of the pilgrim as he's locked in a terrible dream. But the interesting thing is that Dante is insistent that his character is not sleeping. In fact, it was sleep that got him into the dark wood in the first place. How I came there, I cannot really tell. I was so full of sleep when I forsook the one true way. However he got there, he does not know. But he can remember clearly the disoriented terror which came over him, like a child who has woken up from a bad dream and can't remember where he is. The poem dramatically begins by recalling the memory of the experience. Midway in the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost. Ah, oh, how hard it is to tell the nature of that wood, savage, dense, and harsh. The very thought of it renews my fear. It is so bitter, death is hardly more so. But to set forth the good I found, I will recount the other things I saw. After the introductory lines, the dreamlike narration continues. The pilgrim wanders through a shadowy and vague landscape. He sees a hill which is illuminated by sunlight on its crown. He stoutly resolves to climb the hill, but then his way is blocked by three strange beasts who refuse to give way to him. And finally, having come to the point of absolute desperation, he sees a stranger walk out of the shadows, begs him for help, and then realizes that this is not just any stranger, but a great sage, in fact, the sage whom he had admired and loved the most. Like a story, then, that unfolds in a dream, the narrative seems so rich and full of meaning that it's difficult to pin it down to a single interpretation. But before we talk about aspects of the meaning of this initial waking dream sequence, we have to comment first, quite simply, on how psychologically powerful it is. Dante really has the ability to make you feel what he describes. When you read this canto, you can't help but feel that acute pain of being overwhelmed and confused. I remember two years ago when my family and I were in Oxford and sitting outside having tea. My daughter, who was only four at the time, got confused and ran off to look for us. Unbeknownst to us, she started running down Broad Street, looking everywhere for her parents. And the more she ran, the more desperate she grew because she could not find us. You can imagine the corresponding emotions in us as we frantically looked everywhere for her. Dante manages to capture something of that waking terror. And he also uses his powerful words to hammer this point home rhetorically. For example, take a look at the Italian words in verses 4 to 5. 
Dante is talking about how painful it is to recall that wood, savage, dense, and harsh. Here's how his Italian sounds. Esta selva selvaggia. It's a savage wood whose roughness can be caught even in the sibilant syllables of the line, esta selva selvaggia. But then he stacks up a whole bunch of adjectives. The wood is selvaggia, e aspre, e forte. That is, he uses a rhetorical device called polysyndeton, stacking up adjective upon adjective. It was savage and dense and harsh. Dante also uses two piercing similes to help convey the desperation of the pilgrim's first moments. The first simile can be found in lines 22 to 27. And as one who, with laboring breath, has escaped from the deep to the shore, turns and looks back at the perilous waters, so my mind, still in flight, turned back to look once more upon the pass no mortal being ever left alive. Many of you probably had a brush with death, or have had a brush with death, perhaps in a car, in which you see how close you were to having your life ended. Likewise, Dante describes a swimmer who, in stormy water, so rough that he's not entirely sure he's going to get his head out to get that air his lungs crave. But somehow, against all odds, the swimmer makes it to shore, completely drained of all energy and strength, in a way only swimming can do. And he stands up wearily and looks back at the raging water. In this way, Dante turns and looks back at the wood which he only barely managed to escape. The wood, he says, that no mortal being ever left alive. Verse 27. In this way, the scenes, one after the other, unfold with the same intense emotional power. For example, when the weary pilgrim sees the mountain that gives delight, we, the readers, feel a surge of hope. The pilgrim sees the peak which he poetically describes as shoulders arrayed in light. His fear is momentarily calmed, and he resolves to climb to safety. But of course the way is slow going. Dante says that, I took my way again along the desert slope, my firm foot always lower than the other. Some commentators explain that the climbing scene can be understood if we think of someone trying to make his way up a mountain covered in shale-like scree, every time he takes a step, his planted foot slides down a little. And so, though the pilgrim has good aspirations, the way up is not easy. But then, of course, he meets a wild beast. Here, a leopard, which refuses to give way. You can imagine the pilgrim yelling at it, intimidating it, trying to overcome it, to frighten it out of his way, but the beast simply refuses to give way. And then a lion appears and roars so loud that the air appeared to tremble at him. And finally, a skinny mongrel wolf, hungry and mangy, forces the pilgrim to back down the hill. This is when Dante's second simile comes. The pilgrim, he says, was like, one who rejoices in his gains, but when the time comes and he loses, turns all his thought to sadness and lament. Anyone who has experienced bitter loss knows the feeling of this simile. Dante was on the verge of achieving, through sweat and labor, something good. A real good his heart desired, the radiance and bliss of a mountaintop experience. And just as he thought he was near enough to grasp it, it slips through his fingers and is gone. It's the job you were the finalist for, the house that got away, the relationship that broke apart, the child that didn't make it. Your heart burns for the memory of what could have been. And so we have a dreamlike landscape with action described with the psychological intensity of a nightmare. We hear about the pilgrim's fear, good intentions, obstacles, and failure, and we feel Dante's poetry deeply. But in terms of what it means, Dante has really left us in the dark. A number of questions emerge. What is this dark wood? What is the mountain that brings delight? What are the three beasts? Why can't Dante overcome them? And why is it Virgil who comes to save the pilgrim? Why not St. Patrick or Aristotle or an angel? It's fascinating, isn't it? Now, the more you get into Dante's poetry, the more you realize there is to know about it. Dante's poem is like a journey whose horizons continually recede, even as you approach them. Even as we dive into it, we recognize that it was deeper than it appeared from the shore. As you can imagine, when you have a poet like Dante whose work has been appreciated for 700 years, you have dozens of answers for almost any question you could pose to any line. 
In the notes to the edition I have recommended, Hollander is good at talking about these debates and giving good suggestions about how to resolve them. But before we attempt to do some of that ourselves, I think we have to keep in mind an obvious fact. If Dante wanted us to know right away what blocked his way or what he was looking for, he could have told us. For some reason, he's chosen to veil and leave mysterious these things. I think in part he has done so in order to allow a more universal application of his poetry. Keep in mind how the poem opens, midway in the journey of our life. That is, although this journey does imaginatively take place precisely in the year 1300, beginning on Good Friday and moving into Eastertide, and all the journey, although the journey involves a real historical person, Dante Alighieri, Florentine, the poet still wants us to recognize that the pilgrim's journey is also ours. We can all relate to the experience of being morally and spiritually lost, or all of a sudden coming to our senses, and wondering why we do what we do. You keep a routine, you go to work, you play with the kids, and then all of a sudden you wake up and ask, why? Sometimes these periods of questioning and confusion can extend over days or even months, can't they? And we often call them depression but it's a kind of spiritual waylessness. For many writers from classical antiquity to the Brothers Grimm, being lost in the forest is one of the most frightening experiences imaginable because you don't know if you're making progress. Have you already walked here? Are you going away from your destination? Are you walking in circles? You don't know without any path to guide you by. In a similar way, we can sometimes wake in our lives and wonder why we are pursuing the goods we have committed ourselves to. Whatever happened to the big dreams, those impossibly heroic goals? How did you get stuck in this dark wood? One of the great living Italian scholars in Dante, Guglielmo Gorni, has said this is how we should understand Dante's Selva Oscura, as the public life in which it is easy to lose the sense of true values, easy to lose that hope from on high. Virgil, Gorni says, saves Dante from an existence dominated by the contingent, by accidents, by the vanity of things. In other words, being lost in the dark wood is not necessarily connected to sinful living or even neglecting your daily duties. It's a loss of the deep, inspiring memory of why you are doing those things you must do. It's a forgetfulness of the big dream. If you further remember the imaginary date of the poem, 1300, then we can say that at least five years had passed since Dante had written those words at the end of the Vita Nuova. And after 1300, another five years would pass before he began to work on the comedy. The Italian scholar I mentioned, Gorni, also suggests that this failure to begin the promised poem is associated with the dark wood. Dante had lost that vision, the animation, the inspiration to do it. He had lost the vision of love, the sense of the palpable nearness of God. The deserted landscape of the poem also helps us visualize this area as a spiritual wasteland devoid of the presence of God. In fact, Dante builds in a powerful reference to the prophet Jeremiah even at the beginning of Canto I. In chapter 5 of Jeremiah, the prophet laments that, Try as you might, you cannot find a righteous man in the world. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. Wherefore, a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. Dante's own beasts seem to come directly from Jeremiah with an important difference. In Jeremiah, the beasts are agents of destruction, violent and bloodthirsty animals which creep back into the semi-deserted city when it begins to fall into ruins. In Dante, though, they also have an allegorical element, as if the great punishment of the wicked is not necessarily to receive external chastisement, but rather to be left to the desire of their own hearts. Some scholars speculate that the three beasts might represent envy in the leopard, pride in the lion, and cupidity in the wolf. The wolf is definitely the easiest to identify. She is described by Virgil in this way. Her nature is so vicious and malign. Her greedy appetite is never sated. After she feeds, she is hungrier than before. 
Many are the creatures that she mates with, and there will be yet more until the hound shall come who will make her die in pain. In this mysterious prophecy in which Dante intentionally leaves veiled who this mysterious hound is who will bring justice and righteousness, we do at least get a sense of what the wolf embodies, that is, the avaricious, lustful, and gluttonous appetite, which even though it gets what it wants, it cannot but desire more. In light of this, it's probably best to understand the wolf as corresponding to the sins punished in circles two, the lustful, three, the gluttonous, four, the avaricious, and five, the wrathful. The lion, with its tremendous, tremendous violent roar, probably corresponds to circle seven of hell, that is, the realm of the violent, and the leopard to circles eight and nine, the fraudulent and traitorous. But Dante's art is such, as I have suggested, that one interpretation does not have to exclude the other. Both of these sinful triads could be present in the mysterious beast. I like the ending of Canto I. It concludes almost on a humorous note. After Virgil has just described the alternative path which the pilgrim will have to take, given the fact that the road up the mountain that gives delight is blocked by the beast, Dante responds in verse 130 and following, Poet, I entreat you, by the God you did not know, so that I may escape this harm and worse, lead me to the realms you've just described. Almost as if to say, sure, 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 anywhere but here. But this first response, based on fear, as we shall see in Canto 2, won't be enough. The pilgrim will have to commit himself to a more difficult journey and not merely flee the threat of harm. I'd like then to transition to the second Canto. In the second canto, the action continues, action which we could divide up into four narrative blocks. One, the pilgrim now rethinks his decision to go on this arduous journey. He experiences doubt about his worthiness to undertake this adventure. Two, Virgil accuses the pilgrim of viltade, or cowardice. Three, Virgil, to encourage his charge, tells him the backstory of all those who helped to set up his journey. And four, Dante is once again infused with desire to undertake the journey. It is in this canto, too, that we can get a couple of hints to that fascinating question I've already hinted at. Why is Virgil the one selected to lead Dante through hell? Well, in trying to answer that, we can point out first and foremost that Virgil, of course, was the poet of the Aeneid. That is, the poet who described the painful journey of the great hero Aeneas, who was forced as an exile to flee from his native town of Troy when it was burned to the ground by the Greeks. Now, for ancient men, as historians of religion have pointed out, the destruction of a city was an even bigger deal than it would be for us. Your history, friends, family, and economic well-being are all, of course, lost. But in the ancient world, at the center of all these cities, where the sacred temples and shrines where the divinities were thought to communicate to mortal man. These were places where the gods chose to make themselves manifest, chose to reveal themselves, and all of the rest of archaic man's life was oriented around these points of revelation. Thus, when Aeneas is forced to flee to Troy, forced to flee from Troy, he is wandering not just to find a suitable site for a new city, but a place where the presence of the divine which is beyond his control, is once again willing to make itself manifest. Virgil crafts his literary figure, Aeneas, as a man of devotion to his family, to the gods, and to his followers. But Aeneas' special strength is his ability to resist any kind of mediocre settlement in which he would merely settle at a location which was merely a place where they could build a city. What he sought was a place where he and his followers could could center a settlement on divine revelation. This, I think, is at least one aspect of Virgil's importance to Dante. Dante's own pilgrimage, his own journey, has to be understood as a kind of new Aeneid, in which he, too, has to journey to the land appointed for him, and he has to resist the temptation of growing content with anything less than that. Thus, this canto, which I want to call the canto of St. Paul and Aeneas, is crucial for orienting the journey. All the rest of the journey which is to come, and appropriately, it begins right away by establishing a high Virgilian epic tone. In the Aeneid, Virgil often describes sleep and rest in a highly poetic way. In a world of war and struggle, he says, sleep comes like refreshment from the gods. 
For example, a lovely passage in Book 8 on the Aeneid describes sleep in this way. It was night, and through all the land deep sleep gripped weary, creatures, bird and beast, when Aeneas the leader lay down on the river bank, under the cold arch of the heavens, his heart troubled by war's sadness, and at last allowed his body to rest. Compare that to the opening of Canto II. Day was departing, and the darkened air released the creatures of the earth from their labor. Thus, Canto II begins with this kind of Virgilian flavor, which, as we have seen, is appropriate, for Dante is about to begin a kind of double Virgilian journey. The journey of the pilgrim, in which he undertakes a heroic quest analogous to the great mythological hero, but also a poetic journey in which the author of the comedy rewrites the ancient epic, the Aeneid, seeking language which can sufficiently arouse and awaken the reader to be moved by what the pilgrim endured. We all know how little good words sometimes do. Words about what we know we need, what we ought to do, but then don't really put into act practice. Dante, of course, here announces his intention to write beauties which cut like swords and burn like fire in a way which is beyond the human, and thus, like a poet from antiquity, he empties himself out and calls for the divine assistance of the muses. O muses, O lofty genius, aid me now. O memory that set down what I saw, here shall your worth be shown. But the main drama of the canto begins immediately after the first lines of canto two, doesn't it? The pilgrim, who in the previous canto was overjoyed to find anyone in the dark wood who was willing to help him, now has second thoughts. He starts to think about this journey, and in particular, he starts to ask himself who, if any, had accomplished such an enormous task. Who has walked through the land of the dead still in flesh? Well, according to classical and sacred traditions, both St. Paul and Aeneas had experiences of the afterlife before their deaths. This is what underlies the pilgrim's expression of his doubt. You tell of the father of Silvius, that is Aeneas, that he, still subject to corruption, went to the eternal world while in the flesh. Later the chosen vessel, that is Paul, went there to bring back confirmation of our faith, the first step in our journey to salvation. But why should I go there? Who allows it? I am not Aeneas, nor am I Paul. Neither do I or any think me fit for this. Verses 13 to 15 and 28 to 33. In other words, look, Virgil, I'm just some guy in modern America with a family, a mortgage, and a job. I respect the old heroes, the old saints, but that's not me. I don't have that kind of superhuman power and strength. Perhaps you should just leave me here in the woods. It's an extraordinary moment, isn't it? The pilgrim, now that he's been removed out of the imminent danger of the beast, announces his contentment with remaining where he is, or rather his fear to take on a great journey. It's at this point that Dante's guide issues some stinging words. And as one who unwills what he has willed, changing his intent on second thought, so that he quite gives over what he has begun, such a man was I on that dark slope. With too much thinking I had undone, the enterprise so quick in its inception. If I have rightly understood your words, replied the shade of that great soul, your spirit is assailed by cowardice, which many a time so weighs upon a man it turns him back from noble enterprise, the way a beast shies from a shadow. You are like a beast which shies from its own shadow. Ouch. Virgil's not very gentle here. What the Roman poet, who is significantly called magnanimous, or great soul in verse 44, accuses Dante of, if you look over at the Italian side, is viltade. What the Hollanders translate as cowardice. That is, lack of nobility or baseness. In a courtly culture, this is perhaps the greatest insult one knight could give another. Viltade is that lack of noble self-forgetfulness of that warrior or the lover was thought to possess. That, that is, he who sees what must be done and spurs his horse and charges at the enemy or the monster with a kind of healthy self-abandon. In contrast, the cowardly soul waits to see which way the battle turns before he either joins in or runs away. He doesn't have that kind of inner strength which nobly casts off self-fear and engages. 
But Virgil, like a physician, does not just use his scalpel to expose the corruption. He also tries to treat the underlying condition. And so rather than just accuse the pilgrim of this baseness or viltade, he tells him the story of how he was commissioned by Beatrice. Beatrice, of course, had been commissioned by Lucy. And before that, if you look to verses 94 to 96, we find that a noble lady, notice here, notice here too the language of the medieval court, saw Dante's need and set the whole process in action. If you've read the Aeneid, you'll remember that at one of the most dramatic moments of the poem, Aeneas goes down to the underworld to find his father, who will give him words of counsel to guide him on the final stages of his journey. And so Aeneas, seeking his, out his father among the shadowy souls of the dead, and when he finally sees Anchises, his father gives him a vision of all the heroes which would be Aeneas' offspring. It's a kind of Abrahamic moment in which Anchises promised Aeneas not just that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, but that they will be famous, heroic, and virtuous. Thus Virgil managed to get Aeneas to move toward Rome by a vision of what was to come. But here in the Christian poet, Virgil inspires the pilgrim Dante by a vision of what has already taken place. Long before you even arrived at this juncture, Heaven had so ordained things that you would have strength and assistance, provided that you did not reject them through cowardice. Virgil then asked Dante a series of short, impassioned questions. I saved you from the beast denying you the short way to the mountain of delight. What then? Why? Why do you delay? Why do you let such cowardice rule your heart? Why are you not more, sh more spirited and sure when three such blessed ladies care for you in heaven's court and my words promise so much good? We're beginning to see why Virgil was selected, aren't we? Beatrice, you will see, tells Virgil in verse 67, or movi, that is, Virgil, go and move Dante with your words. Virgil then is the poet who writes about magnanimity and heroism. But he also writes with words which stir and move. He's the poet of magnanimity and eloquence, who uses the parola ornata, the well-adorned word. The result is that the pilgrim's heart is filled up once again with desire. As the simile at the end of the canto points out, the pilgrim's inner virtue had strength, which had been sleeping, and now is woken up by the words of Virgil. Well, for good or ill, the journey has been launched, and the pilgrim follows behind Virgil, literally placing his feet in the footsteps left behind by the Roman poet. And in this way, the wayfarers walk up to the central gate of hell. In the Middle Ages, it was common, it was common to place an inscription on a gate to a city to tell you who built the arch and for what reason, such as the Porta Lodovica in Milan. But it was even more common to carve an inscription above the grand doors or portal of medieval cathedrals. The inscriptions would be written as if spoken to you by the gate or the church and would issue some sort of admonition about how to best enter into the church. One of my favorite examples comes from the portal of the church of Saint, Saint Lazarus in Autun, France, which has this inscription running just above the lintel. Thus will rise again Whoever does not lead a disobedient life and endless daylight will shine for him. Gisabertus has made me. May this terror terrify those whom earthly error binds, for in truth the horror of these sights announces what awaits them. The inscription is certainly as frightening as the image, but it contains a note of hope. It is not a call to despair, but to repentance. How different is Dante's portal, which the pilgrim pauses to read. Through me the way to the city of woe. Through me the way to everlasting pain. Through me the way among the lost. Justice moved my maker on high. Divine power made me. Wisdom supreme and primal love. Before me nothing was but things eternal. And eternal I endure. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. Unlike the portal of a church, this portal to the cathedral of hell promises no redemption. Thus, hell already is a kind of parody of the church, or parody of the good city. Indeed, for Dante, sin is, at its base, a mere twisting of something good, a misuse of something beautiful. You can't be a creative sinner. Even when you sin, you are still, in a way, playing with the rules established by God. You're just playing badly. 
In further contrast to the church, hell is not a place of repentance, but of stony fixity, of absolute frozen rigidity. But to return to the gate. It comes as a bit of a surprise, doesn't it, to hear that the gate, and thus all of hell, was made by power, wisdom, and love. In other words, the Trinity, the God who is love, created this place for the eternal punishment of sinners. The God who asks us to hope in Him created a place which declares, abandon all hope. This seems to be the difficulty that underlies the pilgrim's question in verse 12. Master, for me that meaning is hard. And Virgil, like a good exasperated parent who thinks he needs to explain himself again, starts to wind up, here must all cowardice be slain, vilta. In other words, Virgil's giving the same motivational speech he just gave in the pilgrim in Canto II. But we might have an interesting example of Virgil's first small misunderstanding. The reality then is that the words are hard for the pilgrim because it's difficult for him to imagine how a loving God created such a dreary, hopeless place. Dante, poet, does not answer the question now. He leaves it with us, he leaves it with us to rub us like a rock in the shoe, and he won't return to the question until briefly in Purgatorio, and then more substantially in Paradiso. This is a good example of what I spoke about in our first lecture, in which the poet writes passages which he answers only later. Well, the pilgrim goes through the gate and walks into what is called the antechamber of hell. And when he walks into this dark place, he breaks down with fear and begins to weep. He can't see much, and what he hears is a crazy jumble of screaming, shrieking, crying, and cursing, all spoken and grunted and shouted in a host of different languages. It's what one scholar calls an infernal babble. Dante soon finds out that these are the so-called pusillanimous, the small-souled human beings, sometimes called the indifferent, those who didn't care enough to fight or help, but spent their whole lives drifting so as to never have the uncomfortable feeling of being out of step. Or as Virgil says, This miserable state is born by the wretched souls of those who lived without disgrace yet without praise. They have no hope of death and their blind life is so abject that they are envious of every other lot. Here they are bitterly lamenting, screaming with rage at themselves and everyone else that their precious gift of life was frittered away to no end. And Dante tries to get all this chaos and isolation into his very language. I think he's trying to use language which is the kind of verbal equivalent of fingernails scratching on a chalkboard. Look at the Italian beginning in verse 25. Diverse lingue, orribile favelle, parole di lore, accenti dira, voci alte, fiocche, suon di manconelle. In the introductory lecture, I commented on how Dante was a man who, as he wrote in the Vita Nuova, spent his whole life as the servant of love. He, as he will later tell us, stayed up late at night and became thin because he was pouring into his heart into the writing of the Commedia. We can understand his contempt then for those who stood at the polar opposite of human life. Both C.S. Lewis and Dorothy Sayers were greatly influenced by this passage. Perhaps you remember that Lewis once wrote that the opposite of love was not hate, but rather indifference. And similarly, Dorothy Sayers, who translated the comedy into English, wrote a remarkable essay called The Other Six Deadly Sins, in which I think she had this passage of Dante in mind. It's a longish passage, but I want to quote it in full because I think it captures something of the spirit of Dante several centuries later. The sixth deadly sin is named by the church Acedia or Sloth. In the world it calls itself tolerance, but in hell it's called despair. It's the accomplice of the other sins and their worst punishment. It is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. Sayers continues, It's one of the favorite tricks of this sin to dissemble itself under cover of activity of body. We think that if we are busily rushing about and doing things, we cannot be suffering from sloth. So the other sins hasten to provide a cloak for sloth. Gluttony offers a whirl of dancing, dining, sports, and dashing very fast from place to place to gape at beauty spots, which when we get to them we defile with vulgarity and waste. Covetousness rakes us out of bed at an early hour in order that we may put pep and hustle into our business. 
envy sets us to gossip and scandal, to writing cantankerous letters to the papers, and to the unearthing of secrets and the scavenging of dustbins. Lust provides that round of dreary promiscuity that passes for bodily vigor. But these are all disguises for the empty heart and the empty brain and the empty soul of Assyria. Let us take particular notice of the empty brain. Here Sloth is in a conspiracy with envy to prevent people from thinking. Sloth persuades us that stupidity is not our sin, but our misfortune, while envy at the same time persuades us that intelligence is despicable, a dusty, highbrow, and commercially useless thing. Ouch. These are stinging words worthy to be put into the mouth of Virgil, and the punishment of such sinners is gut-wrenching. Because they followed nothing on earth, now in hell, they have to race around chasing a swiftly moving banner which races around and never stops. It's an empty sign, a meaningless cause, a flag with nothing printed on it. At the same time, the pusillanimous are stung by hornets and wasps which compel them against their nature to choose to keep moving, which they would not on their own do because they had no inner drive and fire to energize them in their lives. But perhaps most tragically, the blood that issues from those welts and the tears which flow down their cheeks mingle and fall to the ground where it is eaten by nasty worms. In other words, these sinners who shed no tears on earth and spilled no blood for noble things here in hell in a kind of parody of Christ in the garden pour forth their vital bodily fluids to be consumed pointlessly and uselessly consumed by revolting, slithering insects. This is the first example of that well-known principle of composition Dante followed for creating the vivid landscape of hell. It's called contrapasso. To state it simply, it is, the, it is the principle that the punishment balances out the crime. It turns the sin inside out, as it were, and in doing so, its full horror becomes evidenced for the first time. 